I see people coming in. So um, welcome to this roundtable. I'm Robin Bates from the Department of History. Uh, while we're waiting for everyone to assemble, I just want to quickly remind you of two upcoming events. On February 25th, the Chabria Center for Historical Studies is bringing us a lecture by Samuel Moyne of Yale University titled The Coming of Humane War. And that'll be in conversation with Daniel Imavar of uh, Northwestern's History Department. And that'll be a webinar open to the public with pre-registration. And then the other event I'd like to mention uh, is coming up on March 4th. This will be part of the Department of History's Historians at Home series, uh, a roundtable on the question of how do we choose what to work on, featuring Sarah Mazza and Hayden Cherry of the Department of History, as well as recent Northwestern PhD and current University of Pennsylvania postdoc Gideon Cohn Postar. Uh, and that will be a Zoom meeting open to any of the, of the Northwestern community. Uh, you can find more information on both events at the Chabria Center's website, historicalstudies.northwestern.edu, or at the Department of History's website. Um, turning to today's program, uh, we've got a roundtable on the politics of Holocaust memory coming appropriately enough the day after uh, International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Um, and before we get started, I'd like to thank Elzbieta Folopituk, the Assistant Director of the Chabria Center for Historical Studies, for all of her work in organizing this event. And I'd also like to thank the Chabria Center's Digital Media Fellow, Gil Engelstein, for setting up the Zoom meeting and recording. Speaking of which, I should mention that this event is being recorded, and it'll be posted on the Chabria Center's website, which again is historicalstudies.northwestern.edu, as well as on YouTube. Uh, so before I introduce our three speakers today, uh, Sarah Cushman, Stefan Ionesco, and Johanna Petrovsky Stern, I'll just quickly say that we're going to wait until all three speakers have made their remarks before we go to questions. And if questions occur to you as the speakers are still giving their presentations, you can put your name in the chat to kind of get in a queue that I'll, and I'll call on you later. Or if you'd prefer, you can put the full text of your question in the chat and I can read it on your behalf if that's what you prefer. Um, okay, so we only do have an hour. So I think I'm going to forge ahead uh, with our first speaker who is uh, Stefan Christian Ionesco. Uh, Stefan is the Theodore Zev and Alice R. Weiss Holocaust Educational Foundation Visiting Associate Professor in Holocaust Studies here at Northwestern, a prolific scholar in the field of Holocaust history. His book, Jewish Resistance to Romanianization, 1940 to 1944, appeared with Palgrave Macmillan in 2015. And so I'd like to turn things over now to Stefan. Thank you very much, Robin. <clears throat> um, and I would like, before I start, to thank the organizers for that. I'm really honored to be able to present um, uh, this uh, short uh, uh, presentation here um, at this um, workshop. So I will just get into, since we don't have so much time. Um, today I'm going to talk about Holocaust memory in Romania and its recent challenges. Um, and I hope that I'll be able to share the screen and show you um, a few slides um, and while I'm talking. Um, here, what you see, the Holocaust Memorial in Bucharest, Romania, uh, National Holocaust Memorial, it was built a few years ago. Um, a January 2019 report how on, of how the EU countries remembered the World War II period and their willingness to engage with the memory of the Holocaust issued by the European Union of Progressive Judaism and two universities Consider Romania, I quote, a model of success acknowledging and confronting its role in the Holocaust. It is a rare positive story among new European Union, Central European members, end of quote. The report seems to show Romania's commitment to Holocaust remembrance and its desire to repair, to the extent that this is possible, a major historical injustice from its past. During the last 16 years, the Romanian presidents and governments have acknowledged the country participation in the Holocaust, apologized for it, and supported Holocaust memory, following up the recommendations of the Elie Wiesel International Commission for the Study of the Holocaust in Romania. For instance, the government established a Holocaust Research Institute in 2005, bearing the name of Elie Wiesel, a Holocaust National Memorial in 2009, one in picture, and a National Holocaust Commemoration Day. Restitution of some Jewish communal property have taken place during the last decades, 
and Holocaust survivors have received pensions. Holocaust textbooks and courses were introduced in the public education system, though they are not mandatory, and many of the textbooks continue to incorporate distortions of historical facts in favor of, sus of sustaining an essentialist definition of Romanian national identity. And a special law to punish Holocaust denial was adopted in 2005 and sharpened in 2015. The cult of Marshal Ion Antonescu, who was Romania's World War II genocidal dictator, seemed to have declined somehow since 2000 did not disappear. And two major right-wing ethno-nationalist anti-Semitic and xenophobic parties, Greater Romania Party and the Party of the National Unity of Romanians, failed to enter the parliament since 2008. Taking into account the previous popularity of Romanian fascism, anti-Semitism, and the country's major participation in the Holocaust, these developments might seem paradoxical and very positive, especially when compared to the politics of its neighbors, such as Poland, Hungary, and Croatia, who adopted right-wing populist policies that challenged the principles of liberal democracy, promoted ethno-nationalism, and marginalized Holocaust memory. I argue that behind this facade of Romania's successful promotion of a democratic and inclusive memory in a thriving liberal democracy, there are some worrying signs, and this apparent success could fade away in the future. With a closer scrutiny, it seemed that things have started to worsen during the last several years, and the country had witnessed the rise of anti-Semitic discourses and incidents such as vandalism of Jewish sites. I will show you some here. Ineffective enforcement of the laws against Holocaust denial, the growth of the cult of former legionary movement, fascists depicted as anti-communist partisans, resistors, and the saints of the communist prisons, and the recent rise of a new nationalist party. The Alliance for the Unity of Romanians, also known as GOLD, based on its acronym. For instance, monuments and streets named celebrating Nazi collaborators continue to exist in various Romanian cities, as listed in the recent um, January 1921 article in Forward. More significantly, the December 2020 elections brought gold, this new party, into the limelight of local politics. It gained around 10% of the parliament seats, which made it the fourth largest party. Particularly worrisome is that Gold received a lot of votes from young people in Romania and from the Romanian diaspora in Western Europe, traditionally considered more democratic. Several scholars of Romanian fascists, such as Raul Castorcia and Roland Clark, have argued that in addition to its right-wing nationalism, racism, xenophobia, anti-abortion, anti-vaccination, anti-Soros, anti-LGBTQ, Gold displays ideas that seem inspired by interwar fascists. I can mention more about that in, during the Q&A session. One of his leaders, philosopher Solin Lavric, made racist statements about minorities, declaring that Roma, the gypsies, are, I quote, a social plague, beggars, thieves, and pimps, end of quotation. And the refugees are, I quote, a barbarian invasion of Europe, end of quotation. The founder of Gold, journalist Claudio Mircea Turziu, who is an admirer of the legionary movement, denied that local fascists killed many Jews during the Holocaust. I quote, what are the proofs that the legionary movement killed Jews en masse? he rhetorically asked. Another goal leader is retired General Mircea Kilaru, who was excluded from the army in 2001 for participating in the inauguration ceremony of a bust of dictator Ioan Antonescu. Currently, Gold claims that they lack any connections with the legionary movement, anti-Semitism, and Holocaust denial. Another worrisome trend in the last few years is the anti-Semitic incidents and assaults in Holocaust memory that are growing. In June 2017, an English language neg negationist graffiti, Holocaust Never Happened, was painted on the wall of a synagogue in the major city of Cluj. Two years later, the Elie Wiesel Memorial Museum in Siget was vandalized with anti-Semitic sexualized and conspiracy theory graffiti. Another example of the rejection of Holocaust memory at the local level is a failure of the government-supported initiative to build the Holocaust and Jewish History Museum, which has been delayed several times by local bureaucracy and opposition from NGOs, anti-Semites, public intellectuals, and some environmentalists. A major problem is the ineffectiveness of government official measures aiming to fight Holocaust denial and fascist propaganda. According to Elie Wiesel Holocaust Institute, 99% of the cases investigated by the Public Prosecution Office based on the 2000 law against Holocaust denial and fascist propaganda were dropped, So, which means that the law is not effective and that the judicial authorities could not or did not want to enforce it. In conclusion, Romania had made some good progress in, tackle, in tackling anti-Semitism and promoting Holocaust memory at the official level. While it's probably not the successful model country portrayed by the 2019 international report, 
the local antisemitism did not result in physical attacks against Jews, perhaps because well, only there are very few Jews left in the country. Um, it seems that the main threat to Holocaust memory no longer, no longer comes from the attitude and politics of the government, as it happened during the communist era or during the 1990s. Instead, it comes from individuals, local councils, various organizations who reject Romania's official policy of Holocaust remembrance and education and who promote the cult of pro-Nazi dictator Antonescu and the fascist allegedly heroes and martyrs. This counter narrative of the 20th century national history and identity, though mostly disseminated at private memory level through individuals, NGOs, and in the internet, it's usually based on ultra nationalism, anti communism, and conspiracy theories, which sometimes are anti Semitic and negationist. The recent rise of right wing populist nationalist party Gold is extremely worrisome and raises the question of the future challenges to liberal democracy, minority rights, and a democratic public memory that includes the remembrance of the Holocaust. This year will show how Gold will react was the Holocaust Remembrance event because 2021 brings a commemoration of 80 years from the horrifying 1941 pogroms in Bucharest and Yashi. We will see whether they will promote the competition between Holocaust and the Gulag memories, continuing to emphasize the fascist heroes and martyrs, or rather will accept a negotiated and more inclusive multi-directional memory to use Michael Rodberg term. The former seems more likely, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, and now I'd like to move on to our next presenter, uh, Sarah Cushman, who is the director of the Holocaust Educational Foundation at Northwestern University. In addition to her work directing HEF, Sarah is a leading scholar of the women's camp at Auschwitz-Birkenau and is presently turning her doctoral dissertation, The Women of Birkenau, into a book. And so now I'd like to introduce uh, Sarah Cushman. Thanks so much. Thank you, uh, Stefan. Also, um, good afternoon. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, meet with you all today. Thanks to Robin for the invitation and uh, Stefan and Johanan for, um, I really look forward, I look forward to hearing um, your take on the topic, uh, Johanan, and appreciated yours, Stefan. And I also want to thank all of you for spending your time on this, um, this challenging topic. Um, when asked to address the politics of Holocaust memory, I immediately decided I wanted to discuss Auschwitz, which is where my research centers. Uh, when people learn that the Auschwitz camp complex is significantly larger than the current memorial sites and that people live and work in buildings that were once part of the camp, they're astonished. How could people go about their daily lives on the site of mass atrocity? So before turning to Auschwitz, I want to recognize that we, generally speaking, go about our daily lives on sites of mass atrocity. So um, I start with a land acknowledgement. Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of Three Fires the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Ottawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes, and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. In my discussion of the politics of Holocaust memory, I'd like to offer some initial thoughts on the topic. Uh, they relate to a seminar uh, that I hope to participate in the fall, and that uh, seminar is titled Holocaust Tourism Revisited, Holocaust Memorial Culture Between Education, Tourism, and Commemoration. So please note that these are some preliminary thoughts and I've organized them in three segments. I'll give a little bit of background um, about each of the segments and then pose a question or two, which I really hope will foster um, some discussion, um, not only among the panelists, but uh, among all the, all the attendees. Um, the first segment is perhaps what comes to mind for most regarding the politics of Auschwitz memory. Auschwitz has been a site of contested memory since the war ended. Situated in Poland after the war, it became a place uh, that Germans wanted to forget and that Poles and Jews both wanted to claim. Under control of a Poland, first as a communist government, then as a patriotic Catholic democratic government, and then more recently as an increasingly nationalistic authoritarian government, Auschwitz primarily commemorates, commemorates Nazi victimization of Poles. Poles were indeed the first people sent to Auschwitz, were murdered there in significant numbers, and many believed that Poles were also to be targets of genocide. Still, in each successive Polish era, the Nazi genocide of Jews and the complicity of some Poles in that project have been ob ob obfuscated in a variety of ways, including but not limited to the portrayal of the Auschwitz main camp as the primary site of atrocity and the associated claim that six million Poles were murdered by the Nazis all while failing to mention that 3 million of those 6 million were Polish Jews. 
the underemphasis on Birkenau, so it, uh, an Auschwitz subcamp, as an important site of Nazi atrocity and the primary site of genocide. Uh, the commemoration of Edith Stein, St. Teresa Benedicta as a Christian martyr, and the opening of a Carmelite convent in a building that was formerly part of the Auschwitz camp, with utter disregard for the sentiments of Jewish survivors. And the Polish Holocaust law of 2018, which criminalized the portrayal of Poland or Poles as in any way complicit in the Judaicide. Of course, Jews from across Europe and eventually from around the world contested Poles' sole and primary claim to Auschwitz. Birkenau, a large subcamp of Auschwitz, held four massive gas chambers in the, crem in the crematoria where the Nazis mur murdered at least one million Jews. In the Auschwitz main camp, there are a number of barracks that have been made into national exhibitions, most of which portray the history and fate of Jews from those countries who were sent to Auschwitz. In addition to the contentious claims of Poles and Jews, there are the partially complementary and partially competing functions of the Auschwitz-Birkenau sites, education, commemoration, tourism, and then I think a, fun a function that often gets overlooked in discussions of visitors that are, um, is research. Um, Auschwitz-Birkenau hosts thousands of school groups each year, primarily from Germany, Israel, and Poland, but also from many other parts of the world. Tourists too hail from around the world. Students and tourists have varying, de varying degrees of knowledge about what happened there, and people approach the site with varying degrees of solemnity, solemnity or none at all. For some, it seems to be a visit to check off the bucket, bucket list, and for others, uh, a pilgrimage. So the question I'd like to pose for this um, segment of my discussion is, uh, what are your thoughts about how to balance the needs of these various visitors from the, ver from the various categories? And more broadly, how do, can, and should sites of atrocity figure in our efforts as historians to educate students and the general public? Or is there something that we can learn from these sites that we can't learn um, in, in another place? Um, the second somewhat less obvious topic I want to address is the commemoration and memory of women in Auschwitz. While some parts of the women's section of Auschwitz-Birkenau are identified at the site, there's minimal information about who the women were and any particular experiences they may have had. Should note also that the men's section and men's experiences as men are not really addressed either. Um, there's almost no mention of women camp guards and other women affiliated with the SS at the camp, which included telecommunications auxiliaries, nurses, and wives, all of whom were part of the project of genocide at Auschwitz. Um, just as an example, the building that women guards lived in is now a, uh, a technical school and there's no plaque on the building that indicates its former function. My research shows that the primary ways that women participated in genocide at Auschwitz were different from those of men. And while men's and women's responses as people incarcerated in Auschwitz were similar, there were some significant differences. I think it's important that we understand that women were both involved in and affected by genocide and forced labor at Auschwitz in particular ways. And this not even to mention the um, various prisoner functionaries who stood in mid, mid levels of the, of the hierarchy in the camp. Um, there's also a lot to say about the general use of women in Holocaust memory. There are the polarized views of women as heroes uh, or the ultimate victim. This polarized view is complicated somewhat by the post-war notion that survivors must have done something unsavory to have survived, and for women that was presumed to entail deviant sexuality. There have also been distorted portrayals of women guards as overtly sexualized or demonized. So the question I pose here is related to, uh, at least partially related to the previous one. Are sites of mass atrocity places where complex stories, histories might be confronted? Another way of thinking about this is how do we or can we engage students, tourists, pilgrims with this complex history in the brief amount of, amount of time that they are at those sites? And if not, then what's the what's the alternative? How do we teach these histories? Uh, and then the last thing I want to touch on is Americans and the Holocaust. Um, a caveat to my comments here are based um, on observation and experience rather than any particular research I've undertaken. A uh, Holocaust memory flourishes in the United States. One example is the proliferation of Holocaust Remembrance Day events yesterday across the country. At the same time, there's some evident evidence that most Americans do not know much about the history. Even so, Americans, and I would say particularly white Americans, are fascinated or find some fascination in the, by the Holocaust. Uh, the question seems to be, how could people do that to other people? Representations of the Holocaust permeate American culture. I've also met dozens of people for whom study of the Holocaust is an avocation. Unfortunately, there, there seems to be no, no parallel broad curiosity about mass atrocities carried out in America uh, by Americans. I should say that I see a wider and deeper engagement from younger generations currently. There was a Holocaust Museum on the National Mall in DC two decades before there was an African American or American Indian Museum. 
while it's important for those museums to focus on the tremendous contributions of Black and Indigenous Americans to US history and culture, the absence of a museum about slavery and its legacies or about various physical and cultural genocidal practices towards Indigenous populations seems an important gap that speaks volumes in its silence. Uh, there are several educational projects that approach, approach American atrocity, but they re refract these atrocities through uh, the lens of the Holocaust. One example comes to mind, but there, there are a number. Um, the middle school project, Paperclips. Um, this is a project, um, it's one in which school administrators in a rural Tennessee um, town and their students explored intolerance and man's inhumanity to man through the lens of the Holocaust. They sought to collect six million paperclips to represent the genocide of six million European Jews while learning about the Holocaust. Um, I would say that they, that they learned a lot and the project gained traction and international attention. At the same time, I also would argue that they missed an opportunity. The KKK supposedly was founded less than 100 miles from their town. They chose to explore racial hatred by looking at Germany rather than exploring slavery, the Jim Crow era, or systemic racism. Similar approaches to tolerance education can be seen in other curricula, like facing history in ourselves and echoes and reflections. I'm not necessarily taking those curricula to task. Instead, I think they illustrate a broad, broader problem that's related to the politics of Holocaust memory in the United States. And the, the politics I suggest is a politics of avoidance. And it goes something along the lines of, let's study the Nazis and, the, um, and discuss how bad they were as a way of avoid, avoiding looking at ourselves and our own, um, our own history with mass atrocity. So my question here uh, is, is there anything we can learn about reckoning with our past through Germany's approach, through the approach of the Auschwitz sites? And does the fact that there are some, but only a few, only relative few marked sites of mass atrocity in the United States offer an opportunity or an obstacle or neither or both for reckoning with that past? And I will stop there and I thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Now we uh, move to our third and final speaker, who is Johanna Petrovsky Stern, who is Crown Professor of Jewish Studies and Professor of History here at Northwestern, a scholar whose work embraces many aspects of the modern and early modern Jewish history of Eastern Europe. His numerous books include The Golden Age of the Shtetl, which appeared with Princeton University Press in 2014, and with Paul R. R. Magoshi, Jews and Ukrainians, A Millennium of Coexistence, published by University of Toronto Press in 2016. So now I'll turn things over to Johanan. Thank you. Um, do you hear me well? Yeah, good. Um, thank you very much, the organizers. Um, I would um, say something that um, has a relation to uh, the rise of nationalism um, that uh, Stefan covered in his presentation. And I will also talk um, about competing um, victimizations um, that uh, was in the center of, um, of Sarah's presentation. With your permission, I'll share with you my screen. Um, I'll show you um, a couple of slides uh, to make um, my points uh, uh, in, in a uh, more articulate and stronger manner. Um, I would like to start with uh, this particular uh, monument to um, um, uh, a Russian writer who is uh, standing um, in front of the wall on which, uh, as if the Nazis put the um, advertisement asking all the Jews of uh, Kiev uh, to show up um, at the uh, region of uh, the old Jewish cemetery uh, near the Babin Yar ravine at the outskirts of Kiev uh, on the 29th of uh, September in 1941. Um, it is this particular Boychik uh, who was uh, a teenager um, at the time who uh, became a major witness and who um, later in the 1950s uh, told the story uh, about what Bad Benyar was about um, a, from 1941 till 1944. Um, uh, he uh, defected uh, to England. Um, his novel uh, was published in the Soviet Union, but it was heavily um, censored uh, by uh, the Soviet censorship for the reason I'll discuss in one and a half minutes. And um, uh, there in England, he published the full um, uh, version of his novel, which is called The Baden Yar. Uh, so uh, just to remind you, um, September 29th, September 30th is the time when the Nazis um, um, executed uh, 33,771 uh, Jews um, in the region of uh, the Babin Yar. And um, what Patrick de Buak uh, called um, the uh, Holocaust by bullets is um, uh, very well represented in uh, that particular horrible uh, massacre, which is the uh, 
um, uh, massacre uh, without um, uh, any kind of parallel um, uh, before uh, the Nazis come to Kiev. And um, there were ma um, mass massacres of Jews in Berdichev. Um, about 18,000 uh, were killed over two uh, days in August uh, 41, and uh, the massacre um, in uh, Kamenets Podilsky, um, uh, approximately the same number, 17 to 18,000, but uh, nothing like that um, had happened before. It is also the event of extreme importance for the uh, upcoming Wednesday conference because this event showed the Nazis that they can actually execute Jews in mass uh, by bullets and not only by bullets in Eastern Europe. So what they were planning to do is doable. Um, the, uh, immediately after uh, uh, September 1941, the Babin Yar, um, uh, which is a huge ravine at the outskirts of Kiev uh, with different branches, uh, became um, a major um, center for the Nazi execution of different groups. Uh, Soviet POWs uh, were brought uh, there um, and shot. Uh, the communists, uh, the Jews who were in the hiding, who were found after September 1941, the gypsies, um, the Roma, um, uh, the um, um, patients of the um, local psychiatric clinic, uh, which stands right at the um, edge of the ravine from its eastern side, um, and other groups of people, including uh, the um, rebellious uh, representatives of uh, uh, Ukrainian nationalist groups who were cooperating with the Nazis, but then realized that the Nazis have uh, no plan to um, establish the independent Ukraine um, and uh, plan to have Ukraine as uh, the agricultural um, addendum of uh, the Third Reich as the empire. Um, and they uh, rebelled, they um, um, expressed uh, the indignation uh, with the, what they thought is the Nazis' betrayal of uh, the plans to establish the independent Ukraine. And these people, about several hundred people, were also executed um, somewhere on the territory of the ravine. We do not know exactly where. Uh, uh, on this picture, uh, the Nazis um, assembled um, the Soviet POWs in 1943, a couple of months before the Soviet uh, troops recaptured Kiev. Um, uh, these soldiers are excavating, exhumating uh, the corpses, uh, put them um, on um, huge stocks of uh, um, uh, wood and burn. Uh, practically everybody who was uh, shot in the Baden Yar were uh, burned in that particular manner. And um, uh, that is one of the attempts to cover uh, the um, any traces of the mass murders that the Nazis um, um, uh, organized um, in uh, the territory of Ukraine and elsewhere in Eastern Europe. Uh, starting from uh, 1944, the Baden Yar uh, became uh, the center of the competing um, histories and competing memories. Um, our today's conversation is called uh, the um, politics of memory. I would like to remind myself and, and my colleagues that um, the politics of memory also has its history. So um, uh, I believe uh, the Babin Yar can have, um, um, can, can be presented as uh, the history of the politics of memory. And we do see the changes, uh, sometimes radical changes in uh, these politics um, every 15, 20 years. And the changes of these politics also represent an important history of the place and of the memory of the place. Uh, of course, um, uh, the Soviets knew very well what was going on in the Babin Yar. In um, the late, um, in late in December 1941, uh, they received um, uh, in Moscow um, a report uh, about uh, the Babin Yar massacre. Um, and uh, before publishing it, uh, I believe this is the beginning uh, of the Soviet policies uh, of memory regarding the Holocaust, uh, which is at that time not called the Holocaust, as you understand, um, uh, is this particular document. So the document uh, uh, says that uh, the, um, uh, the uh, Hitler's bandits uh, implemented mass murder, uh, murder of the Jewish population uh, in Kiev on the 29th of December. Um, so uh, the Soviet censor changed it to um, uh, the um, Hitler's bandits drove together thousands of peaceful Soviet citizens. So for the next uh, 40 years, uh, that particular um, uh, replacement of memory uh, became absolutely crucial. Uh, the Babin Yar 
um, uh, is now a, a place where about 100 Soviet citizens were massacred. And this is what the Soviets um, uh, commemorate uh, by placing um, late in the 1940s, early 1950s. I was trying to find out when this Stella was um, actually um, established, could not find the date. It says here there will be established a monument to the Soviet people, um, uh, the victims um, of uh, the uh, Nazi um, crimes uh, who uh, uh, perished during uh, the occupation of Kiev in 1941, 1943. Uh, there was another Stella that, that said, you know, we are talking about 100,000 Soviet citizens. Um, this Stella uh, really bewildered uh, many uh, uh, Jewish uh, survivors of the Holocaust who were coming to the Babin Yar to commemorate the victims. Um, uh, among them were uh, my uh, grandmother and, and her brother. Uh, her brother, Arnold Krzevin, uh, managed to survive um, uh, the, um, the Babin Yar. Um, he was in the hiding in Kiev. And um, his mother, that is to say my great grandmother and her sister uh, were shot uh, on September 29th in the Babin Yar. So I remember the stories of people coming there and saying, there, there, are, there is only one monument, this Stella, that says nothing about the Jews, Jewish victimization, uh, which is absolutely erased from the Soviet memory. Um, that particular viewpoint uh, was voiced a number of times uh, by the uh, visitors in Soviet Ukraine, um, uh, Jews and non-Jews, who were asking, the first thing they, they, they are asking uh, when they are coming to Kiev, please bring us the Babin Yar, and they see this monument and they say, why do you not have anything more substantial uh, to really commemorate the victims uh, who perished there? So under the international pressure, uh, the Soviets, um, um, uh, after uh, uh, several uh, competitions, um, decided to choose this particular monument uh, to the vict victims of, of the Babin Yar. Uh, from the side that I'm showing you the mon monument, you see the uh, people as they are standing in front of the firing squad. Uh, you see women, um, uh, sailors, uh, Soviet POWs, uh, no Jews, uh, and uh, absolutely uh, zero hints at the, the fact that it was a Jewish place. Um, in uh, the late uh, days of, in the late months of Perestroika, I believe in 1989, 1990, um, the authorities placed three memorial plaques uh, in front of this monument. We are standing right in front of them. They are beneath our feet. And on these plaques, they have three texts, one in Yiddish, one in Ukrainian, one in Russian that said, here the Nazis um, shot 100,000 uh, Soviet citizen um, uh, in the period of 41 and 43. Um, I'm standing there with my rabbi in 91, and um, uh, there, there is a couple uh, standing next to us. Um, he, um, a boy chick of about 21, and she probably 19 and 18 and a half. And she asks him, um, looking at the uh, memorial plaque in Yiddish, I understand this is in Ukrainian, this is in Russian, and what is this language? And he says, I don't know, maybe an Armenian. Um, so that shows you the awareness of the um, of the people on the ground about what the Babin Yar actually had been and what had happened there. So uh, this awareness was uh, close to nil, of course, uh, be, beyond the um, uh, Jewish families and uh, Jewish communities in Ukraine and East Europe. Um, again, under the um, international pressure and uh, probably in order to erase um, um, any um, kind of uh, um, uh, continuity between the new Ukrainian uh, power that came uh, um, uh, to uh, uh, govern Ukraine after the collapse of communism in 91, uh, and what uh, the Soviet state had been before, the mayor of uh, Kiev ordered the erection of uh, the um, uh, memorial site uh, the establishment excuse me, of the memorial site uh, with the uh, menorah um, at its center. It's a huge menorah. Um, it's about, uh, I would say, 30 feet uh, with um, two uh, stellas on the left and the right uh, with Hebrew and Ukrainian inscription, um, uh, which says, Holos krovi brata tvoho volaya domene zemli. Uh, uh, they say the, the voice of my brother, um, uh, the, the voice of your brother um, cries to you uh, from uh, the earth, um, uh, what uh, God tells um, Cain um, after uh, the um, um, assassination of, of Abel. Um, 
this particular site became the site of the commemoration of the Babel Yar massacre and um, a Jewish community of uh, Kiev, Ukraine, um, gathers there 29th, 30th of September. And um, before the new Ukrainian president, every Ukrainian president was there annually starting from 1991. So President Kuchma, Kravchuk, um, uh, Yanukovych, Yushchenko, all of them were with the Jewish community at that site. Then in the 1990s, something interesting started to emerge. Um, the um, site of Babiyar, as I mentioned, is, is a very big territory uh, with um, um, different um, turns and curves of the uh, branches of, the, uh, of what had been ravine and what is now a beautiful park. So uh, different groups, um, uh, the political groups um, and social groups, NGOs, started to establish uh, monuments in the site claiming that they are also the victims. And what appeared momentarily is this competing victimization that we know very well from post-colonial theory and um, other uh, types of historical research. Today, um, I'll show you just uh, several monuments. Um, I counted about 25 of them. Uh, some of them are very impressive. Some of them are less rudiment uh, more rudimentary. Um, uh, the monument um, uh, on the left-hand side is the monument to the children that were um, shot in the Babi Yar. Again, uh, the monument shows children, but uh, uh, no mentioning that 99.9% uh, .9 of these children were Jewish children. Uh, the monument on the right hand side is uh, the uh, monument built um, to Roma um, uh, shot in the Babi Yar. We do not know exact numbers. Um, in front of us, um, the little chapel with a little church behind it is the monument which stands literally uh, 50 feet from the menorah that I discussed. Um, I placed the photos um, for purpose, uh, one upon uh, the other, to convey uh, that particular proximity of the monuments um, on the ground and uh, their competitiveness. Uh, so you really see one monument um, uh, when you are staying at the other, and uh, there is um, a sense of uh, competing victimizations uh, that um, um, are uh, reflected um, in uh, these monuments. Uh, right next to these monuments, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, there is um, uh, a, a monument to, the, uh, very, to a very prominent uh, Ukrainian poetess from, uh, from um, Halichina, um, uh, Galicia, um, uh, Olena Teliha, who happened to be also uh, um, a mistress of one of the leaders of Ukrainian uh, far-right uh, nationalist, Stepan Bendera. Um, she um, uh, expressed indignation uh, with uh, the um, uh, Nazi um, attempts uh, to um, erase uh, the memory of uh, great Ukrainian writers and poets and uh, refused to say, uh, uh, the, to, to greet uh, Hitler as it had been done uh, when um, her colleagues gathered um, uh, at the editorial, uh, uh, at, the, at the house where the um, editorial committee of one of the leading Ukrainian newspapers uh, was um, uh, hosted. And uh, for that, she was taken to, to the Biden Yar and shot there. So uh, different groups of Ukrainian nationalists uh, erected this monument to her. In front of us uh, on the center of, um, of the slide, uh, the monument to um, uh, people who I already mentioned, uh, the um, um, the uh, uh, patients of the psychiatric clinic, uh, St. Cyril Psychiatric Clinic, which is still uh, uh, there today. So they were also shot in the same place. And on the right-hand side, the monument to the um, three uh, million Ukrainian uh, Ostarbeiten who were um, uh, taken from Ukraine uh, by force and sent to Germany uh, for different types uh, of hard labor. Uh, the monument to uh, the uh, victims of the Siretz concentration camp on the territory of the Babin Yar established immediately after uh, September 1943, left-hand side. Um, uh, the center, um, uh, the um, monument to 621 Ukrainian nationalists um, uh, who were shot somewhere on the territory of Babi Yar. Um, again, uh, different groups uh, claim um, um, that uh, they were shot in the Babi Yar. We do not know exactly that, but Babi Yar became the site where people come to commemorate their, their victims because there is, um, you know, 50 years of um, 
uh, Jewish history of coming there and commemorating those victims. So that site what became internationalized and different groups uh, wanted to commemorate their victims precisely there because Babin Yar had this kind of a, um, uh, attraction. Um, I, I'm using this word, quote unquote. Uh, right hand side, the monument to a legendary group of, um, you know, of uh, Russian, Soviet, Ukrainian sportsmen who um, uh, uh, had a chutzpah to win the game um, against the Nazi uh, soccer team um, in uh, 1942. After the game, uh, they were taken uh, to one of the uh, places of execution um, in Kiev and shot. Uh, the legend has it that they were also taken to the Babel Yard. So um, I showed you uh, one to three, about nine monuments, but all of them again are uh, um, in uh, on the territory of the Babel Yard. And the question today, the big question today to the um, uh, Lenski designers and to the historians how to think about these monuments, uh, how to arrange them into one continuous memory, how to embrace um, uh, the Jewish story and how the Jews uh, should or should not embrace uh, the stories of victimization and execution of other groups. Uh, should the Jews make the Babin Yar ex their exclusive place of memory or should they think how to work with the different groups? Um, the Babin Yar um, has been um, um, a beautiful place where people were coming in the Soviet times for barbecue. Uh, today, it acquires a new meaning. Uh, you would not see people walking there uh, with their uh, strollers um, and uh, having barbecues. Uh, many people around, uh, and I believe across Kiev and across Ukraine, understand that it is um, a holy site uh, uh, that um, has to be entered as you enter um, a cemetery. Um, uh, so. Um, what do you do? How do you incorporate this beautiful park, uh, which is about um, uh, two, three quarters of a mile long and, um, and about um, uh, one third of a mile uh, wide? Um, how do you make this park, this landscape, part of the story. Um, from my perspective, when I'm bringing people to the Babin Yar, and I'm very often there with different groups of people, Jews and non-Jews, um, starting from, uh, excuse me, 1972, um, I'm an old guy. Um, uh, I'm not bringing people to the uh, monuments. I'm bringing them to uh, the um, edge of the ravine for them to see uh, what the ravine is about, and then to the bottom of the ravine. Of course, um, we are celebrating today uh, not only the second day of the Holocaust commemoration, but also Tu Bishvat, uh, the, um, um, the, holiday, the uh, traditional Jewish holiday of the plants of the trees, and uh, celebrating these trees that grew up uh, from the ashes uh, of the Holocaust uh, victims is, um, is also some of the ways to think about uh, uh, this particular place. But um, uh, the challenges uh, that uh, uh, different organizations, nationally, internationally in Ukraine today face is what to do, how to think, how to organize uh, these different memories in one story that would not be competing, but would be uh, all embracing. And um, as I'm telling you that, that. Um, I need just to mention that uh, over the last year and a half, um, what to do in the Babin Yard became also part of the, um, um, of the, um, uh, this kind of a, a hybrid war that uh, Putin and uh, Russian Federation um, are uh, waging against Ukraine. Um, uh, the local Jewish community in Ukraine is trying to create um, the um, uh, a memorial that would be all embracing, that would include all these different stories and psychiatric clinic and the footballist and the soccer players and uh, the um, um, uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, nationalist. Uh, although it is a painful story for the Jews, given that uh, many of these Ukrainian nationalists collaborated with the Nazis, into one and the same story that will govern the Babin Yar as um, as as a memorial, uh, but. Uh, a number of uh, very important uh, tycoons uh, from Russia uh, uh, with Putin's blessings came with their project and their $120 million to establish something different in Babin Yar. They want only Jewish story. They don't want anybody else. And they want to uh, create new memorials. I'll show you one, uh, but uh, please uh, hold on. I, uh, I 
I, I will tell you that what you see uh, on the next slide is a kind of an architectural pornography, but it is now standing in the Babin Yar, and this is now what uh, the um, uh, Russian Nouveau Riche are trying to establish there. Uh, so uh, this is how they want to commemorate uh, the victimhood, um, uh, in addition to many other monuments that they want to build there. So um, uh, we are talking about um, not only a competitive victimization uh, expressed uh, or um, articulated um, in different memorials, but we are also talking about modern day politics and uh, the two different visions, according to uh, one of which um, uh, Babin Yar is only Jewish story and uh, all these Ukrainians, all these Slavs um, uh, should uh, go somewhere else to um, uh, commemorate their victims. Uh, that is what uh, Putin's uh, 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 billionaires with their money are trying to impose uh, on Ukrainian Jewish community and um, another project that the Ukrainian Jewish community is trying to um, promote and they fail because they do not have um, uh, any kind of uh, uh, serious financial support and also governmental support um, uh, which is creating something all embracing and the question the, the, the story that I'm telling today I hope um, um, uh, raises the question what to do next not only how to think about these things, but how to act uh, to prevent the ethnocentric vision of uh, the Babin Yar um, um, uh, to be um, perpetuated. Thank you. Thank you, Johanna, and, and indeed to all three of our presenters. So we now do have some time remaining to take questions if anyone would like to um, ask a question to our panelists. Sarah Maza asked something in the, um, in yes. the chat about sort of the overlaps between what I was saying and what Johanan was saying. And I think really one of the challenges of, I don't have an answer, um, but uh, I do, uh, I think um, one of the challenges of Holocaust education and commemoration um, is, is the complexity of, of issues and these sort of over, overlapping episodes of violence. Um, you know, Jews were not the, I would say Jews were the, the sort of like maybe the, the biggest or most prominent um, target of, of um, Nazi atrocity, but they certainly weren't the only ones. And so I think, you know, how to, how to bring um, the sort of specificity of, of the targeting of Jews into conversation with these other victimizations, but also while also acknowledging that, that there, you know, um, you know, people have, people have characterized this as sort of like, you know, a vortex of violence or, um, you know, these overlapping violences and sort of understanding that some people, there were groups of people and individuals who were, you know, both victims of the Nazis and who carried out anti-Semitic acts or um, were victim of one victim of one group and were targeting another, that all of this kind of complexity is going on. And it's really difficult, first of all, to unravel um, and then to, and then to try to, um, you know, express that complexity to people who are um, uh, perhaps less versed in the field. It's uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I, there's not an easy answer. I think it's gonna, it's a yeah. So I don't, I don't know. But um, I think I just wanted to sort of rearticulate some of the difficulties of it. May I? Yes, please. Yeah, I believe there is a question that um, uh, Sarah Maza um, mm -hmm. um, um, asks. I'm so struck by the overlaps. Uh, Sarah, I, uh, may, maybe you'll read your question. Why should I? Uh... Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I just, uh, the reason I asked is because um, Sarah Cushman's talk uh, was about um, the Holocaust. You, you, you were almost mirror imaging each other. Her talk was about how the Holocaust kind of displaces and uh, marginalizes uh, in, in the American context, these other stories of victimization. And you were talking about the way in which uh, you, Yohanan, uh, the, uh, 
the victimization of Jews of Babi Yar was, was being engulfed in these other stories and obscured. And, and so I, I, I just thought it was, it was interesting that, uh, but obviously the answer is, is, you know, has massively to do with, with different histories. But, um, but I was just struck by um, the fact that you were giving almost opposite talks to each other. I believe uh, our talks do mirror one another, uh, but uh, the difference is that um, in uh, the Polish story, uh, we are dealing with uh, the um, memorial, which is um, which, which shows the competition between uh, two memories, the Polish and the Jewish one. Um, and uh, of course, uh, the, the Polish one is trying to impose itself on, on Jewish and how to deal with this competition is what Sarah um, was asking. In my story, you have more than two competitive uh, stories. Of course, none of them uh, can compete uh, with, uh, with the Jewish story because uh, uh, of the um, sheer magnitude of uh, victimhood you are talking about, let's say, we know only about this 33,771 Jews um, who were um, shot in, during two days um, in September 41. Um, and on the one hand, um, and on the other hand, um, uh, several um, hundreds of um, uh, patients of psychiatric clinic, several dozens of, uh, um, of, uh, of uh, soccer players, several hundreds of uh, Ukrainian nationalists, several thousands of uh, Soviet POWs. So there are several stories there. And um, um, I believe you are talking about my story, which mirrors in a negative way Sarah's story precisely because the complexity of uh, the Babin Yar with its multiple victimhoods um, is very different from what you have in Poland. Um, and uh, the uh, the organizations who are um, in the center of, uh, of telling the Jewish story um, in, um, in this Polish memorial um, are uh, trying to um, compete with the Polish story. There is uh, very little competition in, uh, in, in the case of the Bab and Yar. Um, uh, what is there is, of course, the corrupt Ukrainian government who kotos to uh, Putin billionaires and who takes money from them to promote um, a Jewish ethnocentric story, which is opposed by the local Jews. That is something um, quite unexpected. This is not the Polish story. This is not how we um, uh, could reconcile uh, the story of the Polish Jews um, uh, looking at Auschwitz-Birkenau and uh, the story of the Ukrainian Jews who are looking at, uh, who, who are discussing the Babi Yar. Sarah, would you agree with me? Oh, Sarah, you're muted. I am, I pushed the wrong button to unmute. Um, master of technology after the pandemic. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah, so I, I think that the story at Auschwitz is a little bit more, it's actually more complex. I mean, there were, there certainly were um, Soviet POW victims there, um, some of whom were women, there were Roman Sinti. Uh, victims, but it seems it, it, in the in the sort of commemorative um, landscape, I would say it is a little bit more um, sort of bifurcated as opposed to um, uh, as opposed to um, these sort of multiplicities. I don't necessarily think that's the right way that, for it to be. Um, uh, I think I'll just stop there because I know there's a, there's a question for Stefan, and I want to make sure I'm just conscious of time, and I want to make sure he gets a chance to answer that. Yes, um, there's a question from Gil for Stefan. Um, could you speak about the opposition by several NGOs, civil society to Jewish commemoration sites suggested? What binds this coalition? Thank you very much, uh, Jill. Um, yes, absolutely. So, I mean, apparently the, the, there is opposition from a very heterogeneous group. I mean, different um, individuals, prominent public intellectuals, organizations, including environmentalists. Most of them invoke different reasons. Like, uh, the environmental is that, uh, for example, there was a lot of opposition to building the Holocaust Memorial I showed in Bucharest. Uh, that was a little park, a little square. They, they have to cut the trees, although the city hall pledged and they planted more trees, like 10 times more in another part of the city. Uh, but others invoke um, 
this comp competition with the gulag that also kind of um, with the gulag victims uh, with the communist terror that was mentioned by by Hanan, saying that for example why should we have this i mean holocaust memorial in bucharest this was a debate before 2009 when that was built and now the jewish holocaust museum we don't have a, a gulag victims museum in bucharest uh, or a large memorial there is another one but far away actually the ironic the largest one it's in the city of Sibiet, but there is also the elevated memorial house there is some tension there um but so there are different reasons i mean public reason invoked for this opposition to, but i think ultimately it has to do with the understand how they understand Romanian nation. So it has to do with ethno-nationalism, right? The in community and Jews are still not part of this community. So anti-Semitism and ethno-nationalism. Even though there is a very small Jewish community today, I mean, about 3,400 or 500, that's the last census. Most of them elderly, so the community is vanishing. It's like exactly what Bernard Wasserstein mentioned a long time ago, the vanishing diaspora. In Romania, it's vanishing, it looks like. Um, but still, the Jews are not seen yet as part of the the in-group, the national community. I think ultimately this is the main group. There's a couple more questions in the chat. This one's for everyone from uh, Lester Greenman. I wonder, are non-Jews in Eastern Europe embracing victimhood because they feel the Jewish only story casts them as the guilty descendants of collaborators? So I don't know whether Stefan, Johan, and Sarah would have thoughts on that. Maybe Yohanan, maybe I think is more qualified to answer. Um, I will answer very briefly. Um, uh, no, I don't think so. Um, uh, Lester, I'm, I'm glad to see you here. Um, uh, I think that the reason is different. Um, although many Jews know today that uh, there were hundreds and thousands of um, uh, Ukrainian nationalist-minded um, men and women who collaborated with the Nazis uh, before starting to find them in 1943. Um, the understanding that these people were fighting for uh, what they thought would become an independent Ukraine is very much there. And um, Jews are ready to put aside uh, the fact that uh, there was the case of collaboration and embrace the story of the Ukrainian nationalists as victims of the, uh, of the Third Reich because Ukraine is trying to emerge as the post-colonialist um, uh, nation state. And uh, Jews would like also to uh, embrace that particular nation state uh, because you know, uh, in this nation state, the stories of uh, um, Ukrainians who are fighting for Ukrainian independence in the past becomes kind of a new gospel. And um, that is something to take into consideration. That is kind of local political correctness that um, we have uh, to think about. And then we have one more question in the chat. This one also for Yohanan. Um, this is from Ruby Daly. What is Putin's stake in inserting himself into the current memorialization effort? What kind of historical manipulation is he aiming for exactly? Uh, I believe it's, um, it's, it's an obvious question. Um, uh, if you follow what is going on in the Russian Federation, um, uh, Putin uh, two days ago um, uh, signed um, a new law, a new regulation that absolutely forbids uh, to equate uh, the um, uh, communist regime and the Nazi regime. So what we read about in Grossman's Life and Fate, uh, what historians, um, um, uh, starting with Timothy Snyder, uh, are constantly talking about Europe divided between the two empires, um, is absolutely now on an official level forbidden in the Russian Federation. Um, uh, Russia absolutely refuses, I, I want to say Russia, I mean uh, official Russia of, of Mr. Putin absolutely refuses to acknowledge uh, the fact that the um, uh, uh, Soviet Union somehow participated or instigated uh, the Second World War. There was no such thing as Ribbentrop Molotov Pact. Um, uh, Russia never partitioned Poland with the Nazis in September 1939. Uh, Russia entered the war on the 22nd of June 1941. And it was not the um, Second World War for the, uh, for the Soviets. It was the Great Patriotic War. So the Russians defended their own state. So uh, Putin is trying to do whatever he can to reinstate the Soviet legend 
uh, about the Second World War and to um, erase any kind of implication of Stalin and Stalinism um, in the creation of the premises, very important premises for the Second World War in September 1939. So um, this is one, one thing that he's trying to do. And second thing is, is absolutely obvious also. He is trying to show that when Ukraine is seeking any kind of independence, there are pogroms. The um, uh, Rebellion, 1648, um, uh, Petlura's rule of, uh, of uh, relatively uh, independent um, uh, bourgeois Ukraine from 1917 till 1920, um, uh, the um, implication of Ukrainian nationalists in the execution, uh, mass execution of the Jews um, during the Great Patriotic War. Um, so um, uh, there can be no... Um, uh, friendly relation, any kind of cooperation between uh, those who are seeking Ukrainian independent, independence and the Jews. The Jews should be with a great empire. That is the second story that Putin is trying to impose. And that is what the memorial uh, sites uh, created by, um, with, with the money of this uh, tycoons um, is trying to perpetuate. I believe I'm answering the question. And now I think we are uh, out of time, uh, it's 1.30. So I hope you'll all join me in thanking uh, Stefan and Johanan and Sarah, and thanks to all of you for attending. Um, and this has been recorded. It will be posted to the Jabriah Center's website, which is historicalstudies at northwestern.edu, and it will also be posted to YouTube.